What's up, old school guys? Tonight, we're going to run the Warlock of Firetop Mountain Fighting Fantasy. Going to do a, just a brief walkthrough uh, of this. I don't want to spoil too much of it. Just, so this is one of three, and I've been told that these are some of the best ones that Fighting Fantasy put out. Let's get started. For those of you who don't know, Fighting Fantasy put out a series of uh, choose-your-own-adventure style books in the early 80s uh, that are a little bit, they're quite a bit more uh, robust than a choose-your-own-adventure style where you're actually rolling for some stats and, and then you're trying to finish the, uh, the uh, book, but uh, it's a lot more interactive where you're, you're doing rolling, you're making more decisions than just what page you want to turn to. Um, I just stumbled upon these just a little bit ago uh, and I've been trying to talk about them some more. And so this is my second of two a walkthrough videos in the series. I did Death Trap Dungeon a couple of videos ago. Go back and check that out or I'll put the link right up there. This is the first of a trilogy. It's supposed to be awesome. So let's get started. Let's start with the rules. All right. You first start by rolling stats for each one of your skill, stamina, and luck. Your three things. You roll one die, add six to this number, and enter the total in the skill box. Same thing with stamina. Same thing with luck. Actually, six, twelve, six. Let's do that right now. I'll put this link... Uh, for this form fillable fighting fantasy roller it's awesome all right he's got a random function which i can just make a random name i like gorak though let's oh i like to stop pushing the button burvo no garrel garrel sounds cool but i'm gonna roll for these right down here we've got a one dice so let's do roll plus six is eleven two plus twelve is that right we gotta add twelve 14. Ugh. Man. 7. Fuck. Now you'll notice this. Rules tell you to keep your initials uh, written down so that even these will go up and down during the game, but you don't want to mess with your initial skills. Uh, supposedly, somewhere in the books, you might have a chance to have your initial skills go up if you uh, are so blessed or even down if you're so cursed, but uh, you're not supposed to mess with those normally. Man, he's even got maps. This is a nice tool. I had out of this in my last video, but I really appreciate this. Good job, F. Good job, dude. Whoever you are. So your skill is your fighting. Your stamina is kind of like your constitution, so it's your hit points. And then your luck score uh, indicates how lucky you are, and you can use that on certain things. However, remember that if you use your luck and you fail, bad things can actually happen. If you use your luck and you, and you succeed, good things can happen, but you also use up luck, I believe. So when you do do combat, you roll two dice and add the creature's skill score. You, when you, you roll two dice and add your skill score. Uh, then you compare if yours is higher. Uh, you've wounded it if... The creatures is higher. He's wounded you. If you wound the creature, you subtract two. So it's two points. So at this point, you can use luck to do more damage if you want. Same thing if the creature attack hits you uh, or wins. Then they subtract two from your stamina. Again, you can use luck at this stage, but you could actually hurt yourself by using luck as well. So you can you continue this process until someone's stamina is zero. You can only run away if it tells you you can run away. If you do, you'll lose some stamina for running away. Sometimes you'll fight more than one monster, it'll tell you what to do. So you're trying to roll equal to or below, not over, uh, when you're using your luck. If you get below, you're lucky. If you get above, you're unlucky. Each time you test your luck, yeah, you have to subtract one point from your current luck score. Thus, you'll soon realize that if you rely on your luck all the time, it becomes even harder because your luck goes down. So if you've just hit a creature, you can test your luck as described above. Uh, and you may subtract an extra two points if you succeed. However, if you're unlucky, you actually give him back one. And instead of doing two points that you would normally do, you only do one point of damage. If the creature has wounded you, you can do the same thing. You can restore one point back to yourself. If you're unlucky, you subtract an extra point of damage. So you have 10 provisions that you can eat that will help you get back stamina score, but you can only eat that uh, when you're allowed on the instruction on the page. I don't know if you saw my last video where I showed you the interactive Death Trap dungeon game, but uh, yeah, they were like letting you eat in the middle of combat, which I hate that. I mean, who pulls out a loaf of bread and eats it? It's like, hey, orc, hold on. I got to Hold on. <laughs> you get your pack off. You, you put your sword down. I just need to really quick put this cheese in my mouth. Um, this makes more sense, you know, if you're, if you're someplace safe, then you can eat. If not, you can't eat. And you get four points back. 
so you can do that 10 times in this adventure a uh, potion of strength restore your stamina to its initial value sometimes you can you'll get a rewarded luck and may even exceed your initial value that's what i was talking about earlier all right so you're armed with a sword and dressed in leather armor you have a haversack backpack on your back to hold your provisions and any treasure you may come across you also carry a lantern let's write that down It tells us, in addition, you may take one bottle of magical potion, which will aid you on your way. You may choose to take the bottle of any of the following. So you've got skill to get your skill back, um, strength to get your stamina back. So this this will restore your attack. Uh, this will restore your stamina. I don't know why. I, well, I guess we'll find out how, how your skill will go down. And, of course, your... Oh, so if you get a potion of fortune, you get all your luck points back plus one. So that's cool. And one potion has two um, measures. These potions may take any time. I'm taking a measure of this potion. Where did I see that at? Yeah, for two measures, meaning you could do this twice. I don't know why I wouldn't. I, I'm going to take potion of strength. It just seems right. Maybe I'll wish later that I did the luck. I don't have any idea why I'd want to do a skill, but we'll find out in a minute. Getting ready to go into the dungeon of a freaking evil warlock. So for, for these books, they tell you to note that th there's only one true way through the warlock's dungeon, and it will take you several tries. So, you know, they probably they were trying to keep these kids uh, from wanting to kill themselves when they tried 20 times, I guess, and still couldn't do it. Um, what I find awesome about this is if I was a kid playing this game, and oh, by the way, let me show you this. Got this book off of Etsy. The place to go. I don't want to open it up too much, but I just found this so cool. Look how quaint. Look, there's pencil marks. Some little child. Probably a boy. Some little boy. Back in the early 80s. Was playing this and has writing it. So imagine, you don't have the internet. You don't have all the RPG video games that we have today. But you get one of these. Man, this would have been amazing. And you, like it says, you got to make a map. if you're Because you have to try this... You know, I don't know how many times to, to find the one way through. If you don't make a map, you're forgetting on the fifth or sixth try. So you've got a map. Uh, you're seeing how to get through. And so every time you kind of learn. feels like a cheat code, but that's just the way the game is. But just with the, 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 the thing is set up. And um, yeah, man, how fun. I don't know how I miss these in the 80s. Oh, also in this book, guys, this is really cool. So if you're at home. You're a kid. You've, all you've got is a pencil and some paper. You don't have dice, right, for some reason. I don't know. You don't, why would you not have dice? I don't know. But if you're not, they put, at least in the newer books, I don't think the original, at least the one that I found here didn't have it, but the the old, newer books started adding double dice. See right there. There's dice rolls right there. So if you don't have two dice, you just shuffle and roll. I can see how you could learn to cheat that system pretty bad, but what's that? What I get? Is that? Did I get box cars? Yeah, baby. Only a foolhardy adventure would embark upon such a perilous quest without first finding out as much as possible about the mountain and its treasures. Before your arrival at the foot of the Firetop Mountain, you spent several days with the townsfolk of a local village, some two days' journey from the base. Being a likable sort of person, you found it easy to get on with the local peasants. Although they told many stories about the mysterious warlock sanctuary, you could not feel sure that all, or indeed any, of these were based on fact. The villagers had seen many adventurers pass through on their way to the mountain, but very few ever returned. The journey ahead was extremely dangerous. That you knew for certain. Of those who returned to the village, none contemplated going back to Firetop Mountain. There seemed to be some truth in the rumor that the warlock's treasure was stored in a magnificent chest with two locks. And the keys to these locks were guarded by various creatures within the dungeons. The warlock himself was a sorcerer of great power. Some described him as old others as young. Some said his power came from an enchanted deck of cards. Others said the silky black gloves that he wore. The entrance to the mountain was guarded by a pack of warty-faced goblins, stupid creatures, fond of their food and drink. Towards the inner chamber, the creatures became more fearsome. To reach the inner chambers, you would have to cross a river. The ferry service was regular, but the ferryman enjoyed a good barter, so you should save a gold piece for the trip. The locals also encouraged you to take a good map for your wanderings, for without a map, you would end up hopelessly lost within the mountain. 
When it finally came to your day of leaving, the whole village turned out to wish you a safe journey. Tears came to the eyes of many of the women, young and old alike. You couldn't help but wondering, though, whether they were tears of sorrow, shed by eyes which would never see you alive again. At last, your two-day hike is over. You unsheathe your sword, lay it on the ground, and sigh with relief as you lower yourself down onto the mossy rocks to sit for a moment's rest. You stretch, rub your eyes, and finally look up at Firetop Mountain. The very mountain itself looks menacing. The steep face in front of you looks to have been savaged by the claws of some gargantuan beast. Sharp, rocky crags jut out of at unnatural angles. At the top of the mountain, you can see the eerie red coloring probably some strange vegetation which has given the mountain its name. Perhaps no one will ever know exactly what grows up there, as climbing the peak must surely be impossible. Your quest lies ahead of you. Across the clearing is a dark cave entrance. You pick up your sword, get to your feet, and consider what dangers may lie ahead of you. But with determination, you thrust your sword home into its scabbard and approach the cave. You peer into the gloom to see dark, slimy walls with pools of water on the stone floor in front of you. The air is cold and dank. You light your lantern and you step wearily into the blackness. Cobwebs brush your face and you hear the scurrying of tiny feet. Rats, most likely. You set off into the cave. After a few yards, you arrive at a junction. You can turn east or west. Well, I'm left of hand, so clearly I should go west. There is a right hand turn to the north in the passage. Cautiously, you approach a sentry post on the corner. And as you look in, you can see a strange goblin-like creature in leather armor asleep at his post. You try to tiptoe past him. Test your luck. Ah, he's not going to wake up. Snoring nice and loudly. To your left, on the west face of the passage, there is a rough-cut wooden door. You listen at the door and can hear a rasping sound, which may be some sort of creature snoring. Do you open the door? Or press on? Well, if we're going to do this, let's get it done. The door opens to reveal a small, smelly room. In the center of the room is a rickety wooden table on which stands a lit candle. Underneath the table is a small wooden box. Asleep on a straw mattress in the far corner of the room is a short, stocky creature with an ugly, warty face. The same sort of creature that you found asleep at the sentry's post. He must be the guard for the night watch. You may either return to the corridor and press northward, or creep into the room and try and take the box. I want that box. Test your luck. <sighs> this box is mine. You leave the room and open the box in the passage. Inside you find a single piece of gold and a small mouse, which must have been the creature's pet. You keep the coin and release the mouse, which scurries off down the passageway. Gain two luck. Further up the passage along the west wall, you see another door. You listen at the door but hear nothing. Let's open this door. The door opens to reveal a small room with a stone floor and dirty walls. There is a stale smell on the air. In the center of the room is a makeshift wooden table on which is standing a lit candle. Under the table is a small box. In the far corner of the room, a straw mattress. Let's get ourselves another box. The box is light, but something rattles within. You open the lid and a small snake darts out to bite at your wrist. You must fight the snake. Seven plus eleven equals eighteen. Six plus five equals eleven. So I get two. I don't need to use luck. The box has fallen to the ground during your fight with the snake, and out of it has fallen a bronze-colored key with the number ninety-nine carved on it. You may take this key with you. 
and leave the room at one luck point. I have seven. I cannot go up one. Further up the passage on the west wall, you see another similar door. You listen at the door and grimace to hear the worst singing you have ever heard in your life. Well, let's see what this is. The door opens to reveal a small room. The room is dirty and unkempt. A straw mattress lies in one corner. In the center of the room is a wooden table upon which a candle burns, lighting the room with its flickering flame. A small box rests under the table once again. Seated around the table are two small creatures with warty skin, dressed in leather armor. They are drinking some sort of grog and, by the way they stagger to their feet on your arrival, you assume they are very drunk. Well, swine, time for your end. The two drunken orcs you now face are obviously startled at your entrance and, as quickly as they are able, they fumble around for their weapons. You must attack each one in turn. Their drunkenness allows you to add one point to your dice roll when rolling to work out your attack strength. Use luck. Ha ha. Oh, I had an option to escape. I don't think so. You wipe the bloodied sword on the mattress. The green blood leaves a slimy stain on the straw. Stepping over the bodies towards the table, you flinch at the foul stench of the creatures. You pick up the box from under the table and examine it. It's a small wooden box with crude hinges. The name, Farigo di Maggio, is inscribed on a brass nameplate on its lid. Why would I not open this? The box contains a small leather-bound book entitled The Making and Casting of Dragonfire. You open the pages and begin to read. Fortunately, it is written in your own language, and so was probably not understood by the orcs. Otherwise, this treasure would certainly not be as loosely guarded as it was. The book is written in tiny handwriting by Farigo di Maggio. In it, he tells the story of his life's work. The creation of the Dragonfire spell with which to fight evil dragons. You read how, in his last years, Farigo finally perfected his spell, but by then was too old to make use of it. So he completed his book, locked it in a chest, and hid it in the depths of Firetop Mountain. Afraid that it might fall into the wrong hands, the last page reads, And so, you who hold this book, you have my life's work in your hands. The power of destruction is yours if you wish it, but do not waste it. Unless you use the spell for the purpose for which it was intended, you shall be consumed by the evil itself and die by the fire from your own hands. Remember, only when the dragon breathes its fire at you should you raise your arms and say, Echo Erif, Echo Erif, Erif Erif, Demasio. You say these words slowly and softly. Suddenly the page seems to glow, and as this glowing disappears, so do the words on the page of the book. You repeat the spell to yourself to memorize it, and leave the room.
So guys, that's all I have time for today. But if you'd like for me to continue, let me know in the comments. Maybe I'll make part two, part three, and try to continue along the book. I hate to just stop so early in the book, but um, at the same point, I don't want to spoil things if you want to get the book, and I just kind of wanted to give you a flavor of the book. I have a feeling this is going to be a really, really fun adventure. Um, so maybe I just hold off and see if you guys want me to make a part two and uh, keep going on it. Well, thanks a lot, guys, for hanging out with me for The Warlock of Firetop Mountain. Uh, want to see more of these? Let me know. I appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, we'll be seeing you later. And like they always say in the cartoons, there ain't no school like that old school. Thank you.